Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Zoke Firms PLC Polish Factory Virtual Tour and Investor Q&A presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and will notify you by email when these are ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I would now like to hand you over to David Serling, CEO, and Gary McGrath, CFO. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we are keeping our cameras off to uh, ensure best audio quality uh, with broadband issues uh, in various places. So my name is David Sterling. I'm the group chief exec. And uh, Gary McGrath is on here. Also, he's our group CFO. Uh, before we go to the virtual tour of our polling facility, we thought it would be appropriate just to remind people um, of what we do, how our assets work, etc. And that will give us a pretty good context for the virtual tour of the site in Brzeg. Um, Zofoam's strategy is to use our unique technology to create foams with uh, specific attributes for you know, demanding applications worldwide. We are typically not used in uh, single-use plastics. Uh, most of our foams are reasonably expensive, technical solutions to things like fire retardancy, energy management, insulation, protection, etc., across a wide variety of industries, uh, but driven by key trends such as regulation, environment, demographics, uh, which should, over the longer term, give us higher than average growth rates. We think about our product range in basically two different types, polyolefin foams, which are used in uh, a huge variety of applications and made from commonly available plastics that you might find in a, a milk bottle or a carrier bag. Um, we also make what we call high performance products, which are made typically engineered for more demanding applications. Um, and those are going into things like aerospace, the Nike agreement where we supply for high performance footwear, and things like technical installation in clean rooms. Those tend to be higher priced, more technical materials, more demanding to make as well. And uh, when we talk about capacity, uh, one of the things that, that matters is that actually we use the same base technology to make sheets of foam from these different materials. Some of our more technical materials can only be made in the more recently uh, developed equipment, but I'll talk through that as we go. And uh, when we talk about capacity, if you see the slide in front of you, we have essentially three main stages in our manufacturing process. We make first an extruded sheet. Um, sheet dimensions, the characteristics, the colors, the polymer we use, all dialed in for the specific applications or types of um, performance we want to make. At that stage, it's a, a sheet of solid plastic. Um, we need to put gas in there. We use high pressure nitrogen gas in the second stage process. And that gas dissolves in the plastic a bit like sugar would dissolve in your coffee. But using very high temperatures and very um, high pressures, we get an awful lot of nitrogen gas in there. We then cool the sheet down and that traps the gas. Going to the third stage, we put a bit of pressure on. We simply heat the, the plastic slab up and uh, the plastic becomes soft allowing the gas to stretch and create a foam. Importantly, each of these three stages can be separated. So we can extrude product and keep it in solid form. We can put gas in and transport it between our different sites. 
And uh, for polyolefin foams, uh, which is what we'll talk about when we come to Poland, um, a good supply, good inventory management close to the customer is key to getting business in quite a few of the sectors in which we operate. We do other processes well, uh, something called fabrication, where we cut foams or weld them together to create larger blocks. But uh, we don't consider that one of our core processes. And it is something that's done by a number of customers. So it does take place in our factories, but also in our customer sites. And it depends which market, which customer we are supplying to. Um, I'll take you through the various stages. Um, the first slide we see here is an extrusion process. And you'll see the, the black um, plastic on the extrusion belt making a solid sheet. The second stage is to put those sheets of plastic into the high pressure vessels where we put the gas in. And that happens on a, a carriage or tray system that you'll see sliding into a tubular vessel here. And then finally, and you can see the difference in scale with the, uh, the employee standing by the vessel, we put sheets into a foaming vessel, again, using pressure and, and uh, heat, and we create the foam. When we look at the Poland video, you'll see the foaming vessel, and you'll see fabrication. We are deliberately not showing the extrusion part of our process, which we see as confidential. And we also have the ability to shape and form uh, sheets into insulation strips, tubes, valve covers, etc. in Poland. And we're not showing that to the external world uh, either at this point. Um, globally, we operate a number of sites. And in the, uh, the pink there, you'll see uh, where we operate polyolefins. That's our, our main market, uh, our main product. And uh, continental Europe is our main market. So we have three major sites. We have the UK, which uh, makes all kinds of foam. We have Kentucky in North America, which makes polyolefin foams. And now we have the site in Jeg, Poland, um, specifically for polyolefin foams. Other sites around the world uh, provide either sales or um, lighter manufacturing. One of the reasons to invest in Poland is our Croydon site, which you see in front of you, is completely built out. We are landlocked with the railway and light industrial on, on two sides and housing on two sides. And uh, you'll see a very large coverage of uh, the land that we have in Croydon. We have about 14 acres in Croydon um, owned by Zolt Homes. And it's, uh, it's pretty much built out. And in most of those buildings, uh, they are full of machineries or foam. So we don't really have the ability to expand further in a UK site. Uh, when we see a Polish site, you see it looks quite different. We're operating there on about 20 acres, most of which at this point is uh, not yet built out. Um, I see some Q&A coming in. Uh, what we're going to do is um, go on to our video and show the Poland site and then come back in to talk about some Q&A. Uh, and that can be specifically on the site, or it can be more general to do with the business. We are in a closed period. Our year end was 31st December, and we announced the results at the end of March. So I'm unable to cover questions about uh, trading, et cetera, and uh, the 2020 year end. But uh, I'm happy to cover general business questions. So. If I can pass over to the administrator, Paul, to um, pull up the Polish site video, uh, we'll come back to the questions later. Thank you.
Hi everyone, welcome to Brzeg in Poland, the site of Zotopon's new manufacturing plant. The site has added 50,000 cubic meters of annual capacity for us to manufacture closed cell, cross-linked polyolefin forms of Zotopon's unique range and brought us much closer to the customers. We have been open now for two weeks and have produced over 600 cubic meter of products for happy our customers across mainland Europe. I'm Wojciech Lipinski, I'm general manager in Poland. Enjoy your visit!
Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Paul, are we moving on to questions now? Q&A tab situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, but just while the company take a few moments to review those questions already submitted, I'd like to remind you your feedback is important to the company and immediately post the end of this presentation redirected for the opportunity to provide that feedback. Um, David Gary, we had a number of questions that were pre-submitted with investors, so perhaps I could start off the Q&A session with those if I may. Um, the first question we had here, what were the main drivers to expanding production into Europe and the Polish site? So it's really about business growth. Um, our facility in Croydon, as you saw, was uh, or is uh, full, um, and we needed a further site to develop a business. Uh, Poland was the obvious choice, given its location in the increasingly important or growth area of uh, Central Europe and the proximity to major markets, particularly the German market. We're situated in the southwest in Bjeg, and uh, it's only a short walk across on very good transport links to uh, a significant part of the market that we currently serve in Germany, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, etc. And uh, that that would be the, the focus of that facility initially. That's great. Thank you very much. The second question we've got here is, uh, what pr production capacity does your existing Croydon plant have in both volume and revenue terms, and how does this compare to Poland? And I think we touched on that one of the earlier slides, but if you could just have a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, this one, because um, revenue and, and volume depend on product mix. Um, so what I, the, the best way to explain, and, and also because the different machines have different capacities, um, so not to overcomplicate it, um, I think the best way to, to look at this is that, um, you know, we, we've got about five, uh, five major vessels in Croydon and two in North America uh, producing the gassing side of it, um, the process, and uh, that gives us um, about 350,000 cubic meters capacity of foam. Uh, the Poland site would be one of our expansion foam expansion sites initially, um, and that's about 50,000. So it's it's about one seventh of group capacity in Poland currently. Great, thanks very much. Another one that I think you had did touch on, but again, if you could expand um, maybe for the for the future of the site. But can you produce all your foam products from Poland? The vessel that we put in there is capable of making our full product range. However, we plan initially to focus on the more industrial applications, which are um, polyolefins, typically black, and a fairly limited product range. That allows us to, to build inventory, serve that market very effectively, and uh, not to overly stress the polling plant initially as we just start up. Um, the more technical products we plan to remain in Croydon for the foreseeable future. That's great, thank you. And next one we have here is what visibility do you have on the capacity utilisation in Poland and how long would it take to increase capacity if required and, and what would be the capex requirement of doing that also? Well it's <laughs> it's nice that people are asking uh, so shortly after we've just uh, we just built the facility can can we put more in? Um, but uh, we, we're currently operating on one shift um, we would plan to go to two shifts at some point uh, in the middle of this year. Again, we want to make sure that everything's working properly before we uh, we overload it. And uh, thereafter, it depends on growth. So uh, we have got the ability to uh, increase capacity fairly quickly on the site because as you see, the buildings there, the infrastructure's there, and uh, putting equipment in of the type we have uh, can be done uh, with about an 18 month lead time and, and a lot more cost effectively for further investment there compared to the first investment where we obviously have an awful lot of infrastructure, land, etc. Thank you. Um, the next one we have here is how is Brexit impacting you and what benefits do you gain from now having a Central European manufacturing in 
distribution side? Yeah, so I think Brexit we would characterise as as um, fairly reasonable for us. Um, you know, our products are not controlled by tariffs. The raw materials that we bring in from the continent are not subject to tariffs. Um, we have seen quite a disruption in transport in the short term, um, and the costs of transport have gone up, as have some of the compliance costs of filling up paperwork, etc. Um, that is easing, and I, I suspect uh, you know every week uh, it gets slightly better. People get to understand what they're doing. Um, so when we put the plant in Poland, obviously a hard Brexit would have, without a without a deal, trading deal, um, it would have been much more important for us. In the event, um, I would see Poland more about customer service and uh, capacity growth rather than Brexit. That's great, thank you. Um, here we go, next one we've got. Being able to store more inventory on site in Poland, how much greater flexibility does this actually give you? Well, a uh, considerable amount, actually. Our, our Croydon site, uh, we've had to store for the past few years inventory off-site. And uh, when you're running high capacity utilization levels and you're moving inventory on and off-site, it can be expensive. Um, Poland's going to pick up some of our high runners, uh, the higher volume products from limited uh, inventory um, types. And uh, that will allow a lot more flexibility in our Croydon site over time. Um, at the moment, not yet, because uh, Poland's, you know, we're still building uh, the, the capability of Poland. But I think in the medium term, um, we'll see significant benefits of customer service and uh, a bit of an easing of the pressure currently on a Croydon site. That's great. And the final pre-submitted question we had, with a new purpose-built plant, what efficiencies are you seeing versus the UK site and does this impact margins at all? Um, well, you, you get both inefficiencies and efficiencies with a new site. Um, obviously, all of the cost, the infrastructure, um, etc. It, it's a big upfront cost and, and heavy depreciation, you know, going forward. So that will uh, be until we reach higher levels of utilization, it will be the predominant uh, force on, on the profitability of that site. Um, built into that site, we have, you know, more efficient machinery, we have better layout. If you saw our Croydon site, you know, we're, we're actually, because of the way it's developed over the years, we have been operating there since 1935, um, there are significant inefficiencies in the layout, et cetera, that have been resolved in Poland. Um, and uh, as I said, the machinery is the latest generation in Poland, um, more efficient, uh, higher volume output machinery, uh, capable of doing the whole pro product range. but. Until we get higher levels of utilization through that plant, um, we won't see the real efficiency gains. I think we're, we are um, we, we have to go through that. It's the type of business we are. We need an infrastructure investment um, to support a facility. And uh, the first one's always a tough one. So we, we've done that now, and I feel like uh, we're in a good position. But I don't think it, that won't be expected to show through in the numbers this year. David, thank you. That, that concludes the pre-submitted questions. Um, David Garrett, perhaps if I could just ask you just to click on that Q&A tab. We've had a number yeah. of questions um, submitted by investors during the presentation. Perhaps yeah. I could hand back to you and where appropriate to do so, you could just uh, pick some of those out. Um, if, you could, if I could ask you to read the question out as well, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. I, I will, and I'll just take them uh, as they came in, I think. So a uh, question from Mike L. Does the new foam uh, result in substitution of existing plasters oak grades and how do you plan to control this? Um, so our polyolefin uh, foam range, we have uh, our more, most common product rate part of, of that's called plastazote, made with low density polyethylene, nitrogen foaming. Um, we also have something called ADAPT, which is low density polyethylene, but using a, a process that's borrowed some of the 
um, technology from competitors where we don't use the high pressure autoclave to put gas in, we use um, a chemical that decomposes. We are foaming it in our autoclaves, which allows us a lot more control and it means it's a, it's a product which is a lot more consistent than the competitors, but not quite at the quality of our plastics upgrades. So I would describe it as sitting in between, um, in terms of product positioning, somewhere in between our premium products and our competitors. Um, and what we plan to do with that is, firstly, um, there are some products where it's difficult for our nitrogen process to, to make effectively. Those include very dark black colors, matte black, uh, which are um, quite common uh, part of the market, as well as some heavier density products. Um, and we've started selling those already. So those are not in direct competition with their existing grades because we don't make them. And as uh, we develop the product range, we are looking at where we're seeing capacity tightness. So if we see a part of the market where we can grow market share, uh, but we're a bit tight in capacity, we can use the new ADAPT grades to do that. Uh, there will be a bit of overlap uh, and a bit of cannibalization potentially, uh, but we control that through distribution and price and, and other mechanisms like any, any other um, product range overlap. So um, I'm pretty positive on that product range, but uh, it's early days on that, um, although we are starting to sell it already. The next question is from Henry W. What is the difference in gross margin between the polyolefins and HPP products? Um, if you look in the, the annual report uh, in 2019, uh, you will see the HPP products have a higher gross margin. Uh, they are more technical engineering products. They are designed for uh, higher to be higher value added. Um, and because they use the same equipment, but command a higher price, you do get a higher margin. Um, the raw materials are typically more expensive and they're typically a bit trickier to deal with through the plant, so perhaps more eyes on them and, and, a, and a bit more care and attention uh, that costs a bit of money. But uh, I think if we filled our, our capacity with high performance products, um, the shareholders would be very happy, put it that way. Um, we do see the polyolefin business as a good business. It can deliver, you know, good margins. And uh, in our business, managing both investment and capacity utilization is important. So in the short term, having uh, gone through a fairly significant capital investment program over the past few years, and uh, obviously being in a, in a, in a, a downturn, an economic downturn, uh, caused by COVID, we are looking uh, to sell as, as much as we can of every product to get a capacity utilization up. Um, but as capacity utilization increases, we would definitely prefer high performance products over polyolefin in general. Um, although there are some quite technical products within a polyolefin business, um, for example, in aerospace or conductive uh, foams that command very high margins. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tricky, but generally I would say that the high performance products are, are um, a better use of our capacity and asset base than, uh, than the polyolefin. And obviously we have to find new markets, new opportunities to, to grow that business, uh, which I th think we're doing pretty successfully actually. I'm, I'm uh, very pleased at how that's going. And the HPP right now includes our footwear business, which has been doing remarkably well. Um, the next question is from Simon C. Uh, the video didn't show that there was a large requirement for people to operate the site. Is that because it's automated or, or just coming into service? Um, I, actually, I, I think you'll find that there are quite a lot of the same people showing more than once. I'm <laughs> Simon. Um, our core process of foaming uh, that you see in that, that video, the high pressure autoclave, will cycle once about just about every hour, something like that. So the people put things in and take things out um, and then in between they go and do the other things. 
Uh, so we're not very labour intensive as a business. And uh, if I look at our Croydon site, um, we can operate the entire. So if I take a night shift where uh, you know people aren't in doing admin, etc., there are only about 24 people on site. Um, to run the entire facility, which is, uh, you know, um, 18 extrusion lines, uh, six high-pressure autoclaves, and a number of low-pressure autoclaves, um, as well as packing, etc. So it's not um, it's not heavily uh, labour-intensive. Um, and I think also, you know, I looked at that video and I said, well, I can already see some uh, some inefficiencies in the way the people are working. But um, I've got to cut them a break here because um, we've had we've had no one in that site other than the Polish guys uh, since COVID since for almost a year, and uh, they've started up based on uh, video instructions, etc. So I do I think they've done a remarkably good job, and uh, I'm sure we'll iron out some of the um, some of the inefficiencies that that we saw there. I think um, that probably answers the question from Tom Rand saying the process that looked quite labor intensive. Um, I, I think I've probably covered that. Um, the next question is from Vivek saying, the RNS mentioned that will be used for the ASO product. How flexible is group manufacturing facility in terms of adapting the production capacity to the products most in demand as that demand evolves? Uh, what, if any, efficiencies have been identified through the newer production facility, and can these solutions be implemented for the group's existing facility? So, um, the most simple answer to this is that uh, our equipment, other than some old equipment in Croydon, is designed to be fully flexible across our product range. And so, with minor adjustments, we can. Uh, make any product on, on any machine. Um, and as our product range or, or demand flexes, the manufacturing facilities are flexible to cope with that. Um, the efficiencies on the newer equipment uh, generally are designed in, and it's very difficult to retrofit those. So maybe possible in some cases, but um, I would say generally, Vivek, the older equipment is what it is, and, and the new equipment is better. And uh, yeah, that I think that covers uh, covers your question. Um, another question from Vivek: um, with respect to production costs, and in particular raw materials, is there any impact on purchasing function, or is that centralised with materials distributed to production facility as required? Um, we have two purchasing functions. We have one in the UK, which covers uh, Poland and, uh, and the UK, and we have a separate purchasing function in North America. Most of our raw materials are uh, bought and priced regionally, and uh, you know it's it's very you know so the the same supplier would supply the Poland site or uh, the UK site, but wouldn't be involved necessarily in supplying America and vice versa. Uh, so effectively centralized purchasing on a regional basis. Uh, question from Edward. Uh, how should we look at significant CapEx projects going forward over the coming years now that Poland's on stream? Uh, and what areas should investors expect management to focus on? So uh, there's definitely a feeling that we have, uh, I'll use the word in inverted commas, completed uh, the large capacity investment that we had planned, uh, which included uh, 10 million for capacity on our UK site, um, in excess of 30 million dollars in, in uh, North America, and 20 million or 23 million pounds in Poland. Um, the Polish facility gives us very good ability to expand our capacity um, at relatively lower cost, and we have more space on our North American site to do the same. 
However, at the moment, we feel we're quite well invested in capacity and therefore our capital spending, I mean, there's a bit in 2021 to finish off the polling site, but in general, our capital spending uh, is going to be trending downwards way below the levels it has been in the past four or five years and much more towards depreciation. It may be slightly higher than that this year, I think, uh, but uh, unless we announce significantly more capacity would be required and that would only be because you know our business is going very well then i would expect uh, that we are in much more of a um you know that that's not going to be a, a major part of, uh, of what we're doing over the coming couple of years uh, we are focused as i said in the presentation on increasing sales and, and capacity utilization. Um, we've got some projects to uh, really grow certain parts of our business. Some parts of our business like aviation markets are very much uh, still in the doldrums and you know not expecting to be recovered for, for quite a while. But uh, many other parts of the business are in fact, most other parts of the business are showing uh, very good signs of life at the moment. So it's about, uh, you know, growing into the capacity we have and making sure that our customers are happy, you know, um, because I think the, the markets, you know, they feel they, see, they feel as if they're returning at the moment. Uh, next, you have increased your supply capacity, which is great. But where does the future? I had this question before I answered the previous one. Um, new products, new industries, new geographies, or just more product existing customers? Well, uh, James, I think first and foremost, uh, we are probably looking to sell a lot more to existing customers. Customers. Uh, customers that are going to be served in facility is a lot lower or, or, or northwestern Europe um, where we've got we're much more proximate David sorry just seem to lose your think, audio a little bit there I beg your pardon if you could just please repeat the last the last little bit of that we just lost your audio uh, oh I'm Sorry. Um, yeah. So, market share with the existing customers. Um, the polling facility allows us a much greater market share because it's close to customers and can supply them more easily in uh, Germany, Poland, Czech Republic, etc. Whereas, you know, out of the UK, our UK customers, Northwestern Europe, we have a higher market share. Um, we're also looking at new projects. We have uh, uh, sometimes through existing customers and sometimes through new PP. Um, and we have got new products launching. So for example, we launched uh, new products for footwear, which have been, I've got, um, derivative of, of those products some of that technology been, been marketed into places like automotive um david sorry helping our t fit insulation business and it's david sorry just I, to interrupt you, you. We, we just lose audio connect you're not getting me are no, you you're just cutting out a little bit as we go through i think it's just your, your connectivity to locally um what I was going to perhaps say is we, I think we've just got down to that last question that we've had come in, um, which we have heard you pretty much answer all of it. I'm sure you can respond where, where appropriate to do so afterwards. Um, Gary, just on, on David's behalf, I know his connection is a little bit weak there locally. There is actually one more question that's just come in, perhaps um, if that's one that you could just pick up on. Let's get on unmuted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, Henry 
asks, does the site positively affect the group's ESG credentials? Certainly from, um, from an efficiency uh, of the plant, the new technology, uh, the utilization, um, energy utilization and so on, all of that, David referred to improved um, assets and, and we, get, we, we learn more about how to use products, etc. That will help clearly, of course, also being closer to the customer means that we reduce the distribution costs, the raw materials um, will be sourced from Europe. They will process through the plant and they will, uh, and they will be then distributed from a, from closer proximity to the uh, customers in Germany and so on. So fundamentally the answer is simply yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, David, just to, that's all the questions we've gone through. And thank you very much for answering those. And um, just hopefully your connectivity locally just picked up a little bit. If we could just have a, a last couple of words from you, David, before we re redirect investors for feedback. Well, we uh, we had a very successful uh, launch virtual event this morning with uh, over 200 attendees from our customers. Uh, from uh, 21 different countries. Um, the polling facility, I'm really pleased that what the team have managed to do, you know, build this commission, it, get up to very good uh, quality and production levels during COVID. It's a testament to our, our, our team in Poland and in the UK, the engineering side. Um, so I think we, uh, Gary and I are both looking forward to getting out there uh, and, and seeing you know, it's been a while since we've been there, but uh, I think the site is exactly looking forward to filling it with uh, with foam. So thanks for your attendance here, and uh, if you have any other questions, um, I'm sure Gary in our David, thank you very much, Gary. Thank you very much for updating. More than happy to speak to scheduled for. Gary, David, thank you for updating investors today and do uh, apologise for about the uh, little bit of interference David had at the end there. Could ask investors not to close the session as you will be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you access this meeting from our website, the feedback page will appear in front of you. If you access the meeting via the link sent in the email, uh, you'll be asked to log in to submit your feedback. We do ask if you take a couple of seconds to do so. It'd be greatly appreciated by the company as well. On behalf of Zoat Firms, we'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Thank you and good afternoon.